So, welcome back, welcome back to module three, our very last model of this masterclass, Go Vertical. Can you believe it? It's already the last day. Uh, I'm, um, I'm so grateful that you actually are here with me today and that you took the time and that you invested the energy and really were so open to receive this transmission and all that I that I'm sharing with you. It's uh, for me, it was up to now, it was already such a great experience and I'm really very happy. <laughs> so um, when you hop online, if you want, you can share a little how you're feeling today. How are you? Are you sleeping well, people? I'm like, I don't know what it is, but recently I'm really no yeah, yeah okay i'm not the only one <laughs> because i hear it from so many sides that it's some something seems to be in the air yeah you neither okay that's interesting what's like <laughs> that's what i feel like you know finally i'm without a, a little baby around me and i can I, I should be able to sleep and then i'm awake and i cannot really i cannot fall asleep yeah exactly hannah i'm the same interesting mm. now okay we will make the the most out of it anyway and if we all feel a bit tired doesn't matter i um you know just welcome our tiredness as well so as we start i um, just wanna say one sentence about yesterday yesterday we dove really deep into where our automatic and habitual responses are actually coming from and you probably saw that this is really complex. We talk a lot, a lot about conditioning, especially as coaches, but to really understand what, what are all the elements that play into that, we, we, we normally never really um, take it apart like that. And I hope it served you to do that also for yourself and to really, um, I didn't ask you that yesterday, um, but whether you found some insights with the situation that I asked you to carry into um the module you know where i said um you might want to think of a particular situation where you'll find yourself reacting in the same cotton way <laughs> so i hope you found um an insight or maybe it showed you something where to look a little deeper then this would have been already very valuable and so we also talked about what it means to expand consciousness especially also as a leader and why it is so important to really go on to our vertical or go vertical by really expanding our horizon and really expanding our perception as well. Now, today, I want to start with a little exercise um, to bring us back into our body. And for that, I'd like to ask you to stand up. Okay. And I will do that now and show you what we do. Um, what I want you to do is just a very, it's very simple, but very powerful I want you to just move your hips in a figure of eight. Okay. Very, very slowly. And as you do that, I invite you to become really, really, really present to this movement and to your hips. You will probably find that this is really difficult to really remain present as you do that and not wander off in your thoughts or jump to something different, but really, really feel how does it actually feel? How can I really feel myself in there? Whenever we feel a little activated, we actually pull our energy out of our base. And very often we are then not really at home in our body anymore. So our hips are the 
place where we often feel actually very numb, not really alive. And when I do this exercise, I actually very often realize how for me, it's really, really hard to stay present. I like there are certain almost corners where like my I immediately jump off like it, it I cannot stay present. And then there, there are other areas where I feel like I can I can stay with it. You can also pay attention how your weight shifts as you do this from the left side to the right side and back and how that feels. Maybe you notice that you feel one side of your body a little more than the other. Or that it is easier to let your weight sink more into the floor on one side than the other. And slowly find your balance coming back into center. And just for a second or so, just check in with yourself. How much of you is present right now? How much of you is here in your body? Here in the here and now, you can still keep standing for a moment and just Feel yourself. If you like, you can sit down as well. And just notice what you notice. Whenever we do these kind of exercises that appear to be so simple, a lot is actually happening within our system. For me, for example, I notice how a lot of energy flows through my legs right now and into the earth. Like I feel way more grounded. Yeah, and I deep breath, I'm good. This is just another one of these tiny exercises that you can sprinkle into your day become a little bit more present to pull yourself back into your body and into the here and now, becoming a little bit more present, a little bit more alive. And I will show you a few more today. Because today we are going to talk about resilience. Resilience as an entrepreneur aspiring entrepreneur or well-established entrepreneur and resilience is an interesting word i'm really i find the meaning behind it very interesting because it basically means to bounce back into shape so it's about bending but not breaking and those of you who are already on this journey of entrepreneurship will know that Entrepreneurship is probably the ultimate personal growth journey that you can take. <laughs> it's such an opportunity to meet yourself on a very, very deep level. It demands that you meet yourself on a very deep level because 
You're constantly challenged to evolve, to continue learning, to embrace errors and even failure at times, and to go beyond it. And I find that independently of the stage of the business that you are in, maybe you're just starting out or you are already very successful with what you're doing, there are continuously, we are in continuously encountering edges. Like with edges, I mean almost thresholds, like uh, these moments where we know, okay, now, now I'm catapulted out, out of my comfort zone. Like normally these edges show up as challenges and difficulties on the outside that call us out of our comfort zone, where we cannot remain any longer in our comfort zone. I believe these edges are actually gifts. They are gifts, even though they can be very uncomfortable. And they are an opportunity to show us where we can dig a little deeper, which parts of ourselves haven't healed yet. And they are also an invitation to love ourselves deeper. So even though these challenges can look um, quite different on the outside, for example, it might appear that the problems or the difficulties a millionaire entrepreneur struggles with are very different from the ones that the aspiring entrepreneur struggles with. But I believe when you're really looking closely, then you will find that at the core, they actually always come down to the same three major themes. And these themes are the theme of safety, the theme of belonging, and the theme of self-worth. So the questions that arise are basically always the same when we really go to the core of the matter. Am I safe here? Is this safe? Can I trust myself, others, life? Or do I belong? Do I have a place here? Am I wanted? Or when it's about self-worth and our worthiness wound. Am I good enough? Am I valuable? Do I matter? Whenever one of these questions arise, we experience such an edge in our business and in our personal growth. And especially when we carry a wounding related to one of these themes, then we find ourselves often becoming very activated or triggered. And I will talk about what being activated actually means on a physiological level a little later. But let's dive a little bit into these three topics, okay? So let's say you are just starting out with your business and you're taking the first steps and you, you know, you start to become more active on social media and you start out, you start to reach out to clients and things are not working the way you hoped for, right? People don't respond to your post. They don't engage. Clients say, no, thank you. And that's the moment where you might wonder, okay, you know, what does this matter anyway? Nobody cares. I'm probably just not good enough. And these feelings can take then the form of procrastination or jealousy or self-criticism or continuing running after certifications. That's one thing that I did. <laughs> There's a reason why I've, why I've done so many courses, definitely. 
Um, and one reason for that was that I never felt good enough. I thought I need more. I, I'm not ready yet. I'm not ready yet. So I continued chasing one certificate after the other. And maybe you too find yourself getting a little addicted to listening to all the biz gurus and wizards and, you know, taking in all the information that is out there and trying to apply it to your own business and kind of losing yourself on the way a little bit. Now, self-worth is one of these things that is often being confused with confidence, self-confidence. It's something different. While self-confidence is about feeling capable and competent and experiencing yourself as such, self-worth is really about feeling valuable, good, lovable as a human being. It's way more fundamental. Confidence is something that can be um, built and trained, especially through experience, because you normally develop self-confidence as you go. If you're waiting to feel confident before you start, not a good idea. <laughs> because confidence is really something, it, it normally comes from two things. A, you experience yourself as as capable, meaning you're doing something and you see, oh, I can actually do that. This works, right? I'm actually, yeah, I'm better than I thought. I, I can handle this situation. I can handle these challenges. I'm like, again, um, telling a little bit about myself. I like, I have put off offering master classes <laughs> for a year or so because I always thought, like, oh, I'm not ready yet. I'm not ready. I am not sure whether I, you know, and so I didn't do it. Um, but now doing it, I experience myself as capable. I experience myself as, okay, I can do that actually. Yeah. So that's confidence. The second thing that builds confidence is that you are impeccable with your word, meaning that if you say you do something, you're actually following through on it. This builds self-trust that you can rely on yourself. And self-worth or the lack of self-worth goes often back to our early years when we were not attuned to, met, received, laughed and mirrored in the way you would have needed it. And so you weren't able to experience and feel yourself as good, as right, as a lovable human being. Maybe your parents tied the expression of love on how you were behaving or how you were performing. And so you learned to tie your sense of worth to performance on the outside. And this can be a real trap. Because no matter how good you are, no matter how good you perform, very often there remains the sense of being not good enough. Or that you have always, you know, that it's just never enough, that you have to continue chasing the next success or the next accomplishment or just for just out, being out there to prove yourself, prove yourself, prove yourself. But here's the thing, our worthiness is completely independent from our performance. It's inherent. That means you're born worthy. It's something that is part of who you are at your core as a human being. There's nothing that can take that away from you. You're worthy. You always have been and you always will be. And nothing in the world can change that. No performance in the world could change a thing about that. It wouldn't make you more or less worthy. Just ask yourself, or just think for a moment of the, th of the people that you really, really love. 
does it make a difference how they are performing in the world? Does it matter whether they are rock star or a cleaner? Probably not. Like I have this group of friends that have accompanied me for life and I'm really lucky that I have them there watching too, probably the recordings. <laughs> and and we say that so often, you know, we have like, I know th these girls since I've been nine or 10 years old and I, nothing in the world, what they do could change what I feel for them or how they matter to me. So like one of them is a very, like she's a fantastic singer and songwriter. And um, she's amazing, but if she wouldn't be, it doesn't matter. I still think she's an amazing human being, right? And so my friends, of course, I want to see them shine, just like they want to see me shine and they're super proud and whatever, but it doesn't take away anything of the, of the love and respect and admiration that we hold for each other as people and human beings. And I wish for you that you can make this experience, that you experience yourself being lovable independently from how you're showing up or how, you know, how you're performing in your business. And, you know, of course, on the entrepreneurial journey, we will experience many situations that trigger this wound. It's when we have it, you know, it's not, it's not, um, it doesn't go away just by deciding I'm worthy now, you know, you can do that. And it's a good, definitely a good exercise, you know, to tell yourself that because you are, there's nothing, you know, it's right. You are worthy and you can decide to really anchor into that. But if there was, you know, this lack of mirroring, this lack of really unconditional love at the very base of your existence, then of course there is some sort of emptiness there that might that you might want to fill with approval from the outside. But this is, again, this is the invitation where we can learn and where we need to learn to love ourselves first and foremost and love ourselves more deeply and reparent ourselves and this young part of ourselves that is still wanting to know, am I valuable? Do I matter? A part of my work is exactly about that, to help you come to a place where you love yourself through this, where you can hold yourself through this. And especially through these moments of shame, because a lack of self-worth is often related to the feeling of shame. And shame is a tricky emotion. I think it's one of the most difficult ones. Kate, I, yeah, I'll say a few words about that in a second. Um, shame is probably one of the most difficult emotions that you can feel as a human being. But it's also very often a very conditioned feeling. And what does that mean? not all of our emotions are reliable information because when we were kind of conditioned to feel a certain way then whenever this feeling is triggered we might feel it in a very amplified way and we also respond and react in a very inappropriate or um, exaggerated way so i say this again your worth cannot be taken from you it's there, it always has been there. You are lovable, you are worthy always. And Kate, you asked me, how, how do I do this? So part of my philosophy when it comes to coaching, and that's why I only work in long-term containers with my clients, is that the coaching relationship is also part of the process, meaning that the relationship itself is a corrective experience. And so I create such a safe container that you can meet this very young part of yourself and really allow them to surface and learn how to be there for them because we contain, we have so many parts to us and they are also very capable grown-ups, mature parts that actually can 
parent and reparent the young parts of yourself. It's not just inner child work, it's a little bit more complex than that. And a part of that is also providing this kind of mirroring and providing this kind of really, like, I think one of my great gifts is that I can really see the essence of a person and really mirror that back and helping them to anchor into that and starting to live from that place more and more and more and more. But that takes a little time. That's not happening just, you know, with a few NLP techniques or whatever. It's, it's really also allowing the emotions that are there, maybe the grief that is there of not having not having not had this kind of parents and holding that you desired to be there as well. Does this answer your question? Let's see. So one thing that I believe that can help us when we experience this wounding, this worthiness wound in action, so to say, is to take the focus a little bit off ourselves. Because sometimes we also tend to become a little bit self-absorbed, especially when it's our business and our baby. And it's kind of, we, we have difficulties to differentiate between us as a person and our business. So kind of everything that happens, like whether a client says yes or no, or whether you get a like or not a like, um, is kind of uh, intertwined with who you're being. And that's that's a little tricky. So sometimes it's good to kind of, really consciously take the decision to take the focus off of how you are feeling and how you are and how you know and what that means about you and really start serving by focusing on the need that is out there and that you want to address because sometimes you just make it a little bit too much about ourselves as well and then we get lost in the spiral of either not not enough or too much i'm too much or i'm not enough and you know that's that's one of the things we, as women, we have been really programmed in a way, like also from the culture that is, <laughs> that doesn't leave as much space to, to be really, because we are kind of locked in the space for you are not enough and you are too much. So where's the, where's the place where we thrive, right? So it's really about um, letting go of that from time to time and instead changing our focus completely by looking to the people that we actually want to help and serve with what we are doing. And also understanding that, you know, it's not for us to decide about whether what we are offering is valuable enough. It's not for us to decide. And we sometimes will never know because, you know, I don't know who, who else will be watching this video and maybe one or two people, this is so important to hear that it changes their complete life. Maybe I will never know about it, but it has happened. Maybe not. And it's okay. We need to be okay with not knowing how our work is being received at times. It doesn't, it doesn't make us less or more worthy if we know. <laughs> so the second the second theme or the second edge that shows up a lot is this topic of rejection and belonging. And I think it's one of our greatest, greatest fears that if I really show myself fully, if I really step, if I take up more space, then I could piss people off or I could lose their approval or their love or essentially the belonging. And yes, I want to be really blunt and honest. This is sometimes the case. Because when you take up more space, when you claim more space, the system often reacts. The system, I mean, your immediate surrounding. And not always the way we want it or hoped for. Sometimes people around you feel triggered. Because you're not staying in your place. You know, you're not playing the game anymore. You're doing something different. Go back, you know, be just continue to be as, you know, unhappy as we are. 
So if you really go into your light and, you know, and show more of your light and, and take up more space, of course you trigger people, of course. But there are different kind of triggers. We use this word a lot, and I think in a very undifferentiated way, because there are different kind of triggers. There are triggers that are healthy <laughs> because they actually call us forth and, you know, into our potential and they remind us of our potential. And these are these kind of triggers in my, in my opinion. And then there are triggers that are actually, um, and then there are triggers that are actually trauma triggers. And these of course are not so good. Um, but when people get triggered because you are taking up more space, then this is something that we need to learn to hold because it's part, it's also part of the entrepreneurial journey and especially when you're being successful and the more successful you get sometimes. And what is also true, you know, if your belonging is only valid or there as long as you're small, it's no real belonging after all. So it's also about understanding that belonging is again, not something to be found outside of you. But belonging is something that we need to find within first and foremost. We need to belong to ourselves first. And in order to lead, we have to believe that we belong also to this world. And I say that on purpose because <laughs> I know some of my, my clients that, you know, always felt very different and part of, you know, this new earth leadership that I'm also talking about is that many of the people that feel um, that resonate with this term often have felt or feel very different and as if they are not really belonging here. But that's something that we need to really see and recognize that it is a prerequisite in order to step into leadership, we need to understand, we need to belong to ourselves first and to this place. And belonging just like our self worth is inherent is something cannot be taken from you. It's also one of the systemic principles that when you're born into a family, you belong to this family, of course, then things happen. And sometimes, you know, babies are being given away or people are being excluded and all of that. But that doesn't change the underlying fact that the underlying principle that you still belong and actually creates a lot of symptoms in the system when this happens, when people are being excluded that, are, that would belong normally. That's a different topic. Yeah, and then there's also something, you know, when it comes to a woman taking up more space, I believe that we are also experiencing a lot of this sisterhood wound where we as women have been taught that there's either you and me, there's not enough space for all of us. And so I find it very, very sad that it's still the case that most women are being socialized in a way that we mistrust other women. And that we are not really, be, that we don't really know how to, to celebrate and um, other women in their success. And I believe that this is really something that needs to shift drastically, that we need to understand that any woman that, that rises into her power is actually an invitation for us to rise too. And it's someone who is paving the path for many, many more to follow. So that's actually a good thing. But this doesn't mean that I'm not getting triggered. I have that too, of course. It's also a part of my conditioning that I received. But I have also been a lot on the other side of the spectrum. So I've also experienced a lot of jealousy and a lot of kind of being, you know, people trying to track me down and stuff. And so I know also the pain of it and the pain of not being able to stand on eye level next to each other and shine together, you know? And I believe that's, that's what we, I really like, if, if this master class could just, you know, do one thing <laughs> and, you know, we could do that, that we, that we could learn that, that we are more 
more at ease with shining our brightest light together, then this would be, for me, this would be a great success. And I have definitely a big wound when it comes to belonging. And I think many of us do, because again, we wouldn't do the work that we do when that wouldn't be the case. So yes, we are scared of feeling rejected and disliked. And maybe you even found yourself asking that you were asking yourself that question with this masterclass as well. Is this for me? Do I belong? Can be subtle as this. And it often shows up when we're entering new groups or new containers. So belonging is one of our attachment wounds and I'm not, not going into too much detail into what that means. Um, but again, it has a lot to do how we were received and how we were, how we experienced the, the bonding with our primary caregivers. Yeah. So it's a wound that happened in relationship. And that means it can only heal in a relationship. And this is what I meant, Kate. We're making a new experience. And this can happen in friendships, of course. It can happen in relationships. It can happen in coaching relationships. It can happen in therapeutic relationships. It can happen in sisterhood, like masterminds. But it's really, it's not just understanding, but really about, really also about experiencing it, it's experiencing it differently, because that's the thing with all you know, experiences that go back so far, like that have also a traumatic um, taste to it. It's not enough to change it on a cognitive level. We need to change it really in our circuit, in our cells, in our, in our felt sense. Yeah. So I'm just seeing that there were some questions. Let me check. Um, Anja, resilience is also needed when one is surrounded by a negative environment, like at work, while I focus on the others and their needs. Plus, I try not to react on autopilot. I feel myself literally trained. Yeah. How do you shield off negativity and keep a constant energy level to help the people who need it? Yeah. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question, Anja, because it's really, how do we how do we also protect ourselves from the fields that we are in when, when the energy is very, very heavy and draining and keep our spirit high? So that has a lot to do with self-care and knowing how to, to really manage your own energy levels, meaning really making space for the things that raise your own frequency. Having a practice, for example, that does that for you. And I'm not a big fan from like having like this energetic shields that kind of, you know, holds everything off. I find that, you know, if it works for you, fine. I personally, I'm not such a big fan of that. But I believe that, you know, love and high frequency is always stronger than the low frequency vibes. But it, of course, you need to keep that energy high and the frequency high. And you can do that through things that register as good and, and uplifting for you. So find out what that is for you. What are the things that give you energy, that, that raise your frequency? And make sure you sprinkle them into the day. That's part of also what we are talking about later on. To really know what are these things that are registering as good, that are stabilizing me, that are uplifting me, that give me energy, that expand my, my field. And it can be very different um, for you than it is for me. Yeah, and bring more of that into your day, especially during such a work day. Also looking for things that you can do, you know, even small exercises or or a song that you can listen to while while being at work or or certain food that is really nourishing you and you know, you know, it's it's doing something for you. It's kind of building your strength up and your resilience from the inside out. So that's part of it, I would say. 
Hannah says, what has helped me so much is to understand that I do not want everybody in my world. So why should everyone would like to let me into their world? So much relief. I love that. <laughs> yeah. 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 And to understand you are not for everyone. And that's okay. You are not for everyone. You don't. And that's, that, that's okay. Not everybody needs to like you. Not everybody needs to want to work with you. And not, you know, especially when we work as coaches or, or service providers, there is, it's good to know what are the, the clients that I actually want to work with, you know? And who are the people that equally important who I don't want to work with? <laughs> Because sometimes we're actually speaking without even knowing that we're doing it. We are speaking to the clients that we actually don't want <laughs> so especially in our content that we create so it's good to to really uh think about that you know who are these people and who are they not you know how they you know what are the traits that i don't want you know and to also be courageous enough to say no to people you know when you feel that's not a match or this is not um it's not fitting for me and of course ancha thinking of you here you can only do that when you are you know self-employed and if you are in a situation like you where you are in a context that you have to deal with it's way harder and i understand that and i respect that so yes and that's why it's even more important to have sources of um where you actually get gain strength and where you where you are being fed with energy and where you are um where you can char charge your batteries Yeah, I'm just seeing another message. Being out of my comfort zone, I'm having difficulties to adjust to a new culture, new colleagues, new job, and new kind of company politics. Ah, that's from Ansha, right? That's from Ansha? Yeah. Ah, I'm struggling to stay on my path of not falling back into my old routines and acting from bad habits, but consciously focusing on myself and the way I react. On top, I'm faced with a ton of negative energies by the new colleagues, which is very hard to ignore. Thus, the new environment and me trying to be more conscious literally drains my energy on a daily basis. I think it's good having this background information. Thank you, Catherine. You're so welcome, Anja. And you know, there's also the question that we need to ask ourselves from time to time. Am I willing to, to live with that? Or is that actually, you know, is that actually already at a point where I say, you know, this is not good for me. We not always have to push through in order to prove that, you know, I'm reliable and that I'm worthy and that I can do it. But rather say, maybe this is just not the right place for me. Just as I said, you know, as an entrepreneur, maybe these are not the right people. Maybe this is not the right place. And I know that brings up a whole other, <laughs> but just to say that. Yeah. Okay. Now, where have I been? Let's see. Oh, yeah. That's one thing that I want to say, especially to the people that um, um, relate to this term new, new earth leader and that are also very spiritual from their, you know, from their how they're wired um i have found in myself but also in my clients sometimes that there is a danger sometimes when we have this wound of belonging that um and you have a kind of you're very open to spirituality and you might have just like me have that have had that all your life that we sometimes go and seek our belonging in in the spiritual realm and in outer worldly realms and you know and so while there's nothing wrong with it don't get me wrong there's nothing wrong with it but there is a little danger in it because sometimes we kind of use that or i did certainly did we use that as a way to bypass the pain of not belonging and feeling rejected and that can in turn you know, create some sort of a disembodied experience where you're not really fully present anymore in the here and now and thus lose a lot of your impact. And so that's something just to look out for. So it's better we work on our self-belonging. First and foremost, you belong to yourself. 
and that independently from your relationship and from the harmony in your family or in your workplace. Belonging is just one of these things that just like worth, self-worth, worthiness, it cannot be taken. And yes, it's a process to anchor into that and to really, really, you know, go beyond making that a comp or that it becomes more than just a nice concept that I'm talking about. I'm, I'm very aware. I'm very aware of that. So, yeah. The third example, maybe you're super well established and you have a, had a super successful year in your business and you totally smashed it. And then the thought creeps in. <gasps> Can I sustain this? What if I cannot sustain this? So the question that lies behind that, of course, is am I safe? You know, can I trust this? Can I trust myself enough? Can I trust life? And this, of course, if this is one of your core wounds, safety, then this will show up over and over in so many situations out there. And it's very independent of your bank account. We make it very often about our bank account, what the amount of money on our bank account better. <laughs> But um, it's very often, you know, it has nothing to do with it. Um, I have known so many people that had a lot of money. And yet, I just never, never learned to cultivate this own sense of safety within themselves and so they always felt anxious and they always felt it is not enough I don't feel safe you know and so they were running and rushing and hustling and trying to build a, a fortune or their wealth in order to to create that sense of self safety for themselves and it's really <sighs> It's really sad because I believe that many, many people are doing that actually. And it's, it's not a motivation, of course, that, um, that carries us um, to the kind of impact that we actually desire. And yes, entrepreneurship in itself is a very unsafe thing. <laughs> Again, being very honest, it's, uh, it involves risks in the necessity to be able to, to hold these apps and flows of business and income and risks and everything that can go wrong and all of that. And we need to learn to surf the waves. And again, that takes time. There are some naturals, but I believe most of us, you know, don't have this very, very strong sense of safety. So, um, Fear is, is a little bit part of the journey sometimes. But again, just like self-worth and just like belonging, safety is an inside job. So we need to learn how to anchor in, 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 in self, maybe in God for some people that, um, that have a strong faith, they find that in God. So you can navigate these in inevitable ups and downs as, as a part, as a necessary part of this journey. And of course, this lack of safety within ourselves has a lot to do with the experiences that we went through. And especially when we have experienced a lot of trauma, um, then this is this wasn't most probably not the case. So because the core of any traumatic experience is the loss of safety on a physical and emotional level, often both. And the thing is, trauma happens outside of time. What do I mean by that? When a traumatic event happens, time stops. And even as life continues, a part of our system is locked in this place and actually doesn't know that the trauma is over. And this is why certain triggers like the sound of a car or the door or a certain smell or whatever it is can send us into an immediate flashback or panic attack. Because for one part of ourselves, 
it feels as if we are still in this, you know, as if you're still in this terrible situation. And that's why it's so important to turn towards these wounds and to have the right person by your side to actually address these things because it needs to, especially when there's trauma in the background, it needs to be done gently and, and very, very mindfully to not overwhelm the system again. Because of course, you we want to slowly, slowly create a place where we where we can integrate this energy. Kate says, I think safety is my core wound and I'm not sure I realized this before. Sometimes trauma is not a single event, absolutely, but a series of small everyday events. Yeah, exactly. Like having a harsh mother or not feeling safe emotionally. That's exactly, yeah, that's exactly it. That's called complex trauma. Complex trauma is complex because it's a series of events and often minor events that, you know, nobody calls trauma, but in its entity, and in, in no, not entity, in its entirety, they create a very unsafe environment for us to grow up in. And any form of traumatization normally involves the loss of context, choice, and connection. This comes from Deb Dana from the polyvagal theory, but context, connection, and choice. And it comes with, with the sense of, I'm not safe here. I'm not safe here. So we never really, especially when, Kate, when you talk about your mom, when your mother is the person where you feel not safe with, then there's also no place where you can actually relax into. And as a, as a, as a child, we need someone to co-regulate with. We cannot regulate ourselves yet. So if there's no one on the other side that holds you in a way that allows you to, to co-regulate, to, to regulate yourself and to, by, anchor, by actually clicking into their nervous system and discharging the energy, all this energy remains in your system. And, you know, and what we are doing is exactly what I said in the beginning. We are pulling ourselves out of our base, as of, as a, out of our foundation and up. And now we hold ourselves. And you will see many people, and I do exaggerate this now, of course, but just for, 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 for the purpose of illustration, many people are actually walking around like this, you know, constantly pulled up and holding themselves together and holding themselves because they had to. And there was never the place where they could like, you know, relax and let go and really. And we'll now actually talk in a second about what that means when you are in this constant agitated space. Now, I just want to make one more statement on this on this topic of, of uh, trauma, because uh, I know it's such a complex topic and it, even talking about it can trigger a lot. And I'm very well aware that I don't want to kind of bring up too much for you guys. But I just want to say that when you have experienced trauma, complex trauma or some, some particular traumatic event, it doesn't mean that you cannot be a successful entrepreneur. Don't get me wrong. Of course you can. The idea that you have to be completely healed before you can go out there and make a difference is just another one of these self-sabotage mechanisms that keep you small. So to make this very, very clear, of course you can succeed as an entrepreneur, even if you experience a great lack of safety within you. However, if you want to also enjoy it, <laughs> it makes sense to work with someone on these things and to find the courage to gently address the wounds that make you feel unsafe in this world. Okay. So now let's look at what happens actually when we feel activated. How are we in the time, by the way? Oh, of course. Sorry. <laughs> I don't know whether I should apologize or not, but I'm like really bad. I, next time I know that um, an hour is too short for me. So let's look at what happens when we feel activated because any form of of um, activation can actually feel quite overwhelming and it often leads us to behave in exactly the way 
that are not representative for who we truly are, right? We're getting jealous and this and that, and we're doing all kinds of things that we're looking back, say, why did I do this? Or why did I say this? Or why did I act out on like this? Or why did I scream at them? Or why, you know, why did I froze? And we are so hard on ourselves with these kind of things. And I just want you to know that this is actually whatever you do in these kind of situations, when you feel activated or triggered, it's a self-protective mechanism. It's not something that you do because you're a bad person. (laughs) <laughs> it's actually something that you do out of self-protection, okay? So what does being activated mean? Let's first understand, for that I need to actually um, share my, I want to share some slides, let me see. Um, yeah. Where am I now? Do you see my slides or do you see something else? You see my slides? Okay. Yes. Okay. Perfect. Good. So, just here. Ah, okay. So, in order to understand what it means to be activated, we need to understand what it means to be regulated. (laughs) And to be regulated, we speak about being regulated when we are in a state of safety, when we feel safe, social, connected, open. And um, this is actually called the ventral vagal complex. Yeah. So when we are feeling really regulated, and everything is in homeostasis, we are, we are good, we are open, we are creative, we can socialize, things feel, you know, whatever the challenge that comes to us, we feel capable of taking on this challenge. So the experience is one of I can, right? The thought behind it is, yes, I can. Now, what happens when we get triggered? Okay, for that, we need to understand our brain. And I'm using my hand to explain the basic functions of our brain. This doesn't come from me. This comes uh, this, uh, this come from Dave Siegel. That's a, a psychologist that used the hand, his hand model to explain the brain. And of course, it doesn't explain all the complexities of the brain, but it's enough to understand what I try to explain here. So our hand. Now, this area, you can imagine as our brain stem. And in the brain stem, there is the neuroception located. The neuroception is, I mentioned that already the day before, basically the lighthouse that is scanning, constantly st- scanning the environment, you know, for cues and clues whether you are safe or whether you are in danger. The neuroception is located in the brain stem together with some other housekeeping functions, yeah, like digestion and eating and stuff like that. So the neuroception is being informed by all these things that we talked about yesterday. So remember when I said all these conditionings, all this programming that you have received, all the traumatic or series of traumatic events that you experience, the the, the ancestral traumas, that all of that informs the neuroception in your brain. Meaning if there has been a lot of, for example, lack of safety, then of course, this neuroception part that functions very, very, on a very basic level, sees a lot of danger out there, right? And we will come to that in a second. Then there is the midbrain. In the midbrain is the limbic brain that is basically our emotional brain where all the um, sensations, feelings, emotions reside. Yeah. And then up here, that's the, that's the, my arm hurts, (laughs) is the um, neofrontal cortex, prefrontal cortex, not me, prefrontal cortex. I was saying this wrong. So that's basically our logical part of our brain. The newest part of our brain, that's the part here that is, Um, responsible for all the language, the meaning making, the rationalization, the cognition, all of that is located up here. So now when we are regulated and everything works in homeostasis, you know, everything works together perfectly fine. Now, when we are being activated, meaning that the neuroception says, wait, danger, 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 yeah? Um, So when this comes up, for example, through the sound of a car or a color or whatever it is, basically whatever it is can be anything that is in some sort reminiscent 
of an experience in the past where you felt unsafe, right? Then this is going up. What, what happens first is when, when this uh, brainstem says danger, 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 is something that's called flipping the lids. So the prefrontal cortex says goodbye, <laughs> right? Um, why? Because if there is existential danger, then we don't need to strategize and we don't need to calculate numbers and we don't need to um, speak a foreign language, right? So now all the other parts of the brain take over. So these two parts basically start to communicate with each other. So the brainstem tells the midbrain there's danger. These two together are now sending down, down into our body the information here is danger. So our autonomous nervous, our auto, autonomous nervous system responds and says, let me check. And now when the autonomous nervous system says, yes, here's danger, then we are basically sent into dysregulation. And dysregulation means that our now our autonomous nervous system takes over and starts kind of the, it, it brings the self-protection circuit online. Yeah. And that means what happens first is a state of mobilization. So our sim sympathetic, sy sympathetic, sim sympathetic complex is being activated. Yeah. So we, our body is being sent into a state of fight flight. I just take my hand down if this is okay. <laughs> um, so what does this mean? So our heart rate, you know, the, the, the blood is pumped into our heart and into our legs and into our, into our arms. And we are basically, uh, our body is being prepared to fight or to flee, right? And when we are in this state of mobilization, then we, our, we, our thoughts are racing. We are really like this and we are like really um, unsettled and I have to do this and I have to do that. That's the thing. I have to, I have to, like the thought that is basically occupying our minds. I have to, I have to, I have to do this. I have to do that. I cannot sit down. If I sit, I have to get up again. I do this. I do that. I do. Yeah. Now, all of these dysregulated states that I'm explaining here can become some sort of a chronic experience as well. So that Dana said that we all have a home, for, home away from home, so to say. So for many of us, we are not used to being regulated because especially when we have experienced a lot of difficult things in the past, then it could be that your system has learned to be in a, in a chronic state of mobiliz mobilization. Yeah. So you are, even if you're not noticing that on a conscious level anymore, your, con your, your, your system is always like this. It's a little bit, you know, so there is a sense of anxiousness and, you know, can go up to fear, can even go up to panic attacks. It can go in all directions, can go in into the direction of anger or, or rage or, you know, just being very agitated, just being, you know, not really, not really grounded, not really a oof. And you you hear me when I illustrate it by speaking like that, right? You know that I'm speaking faster, I'm speaking louder. I'm like, this is the energy of being in, in a sympathetic state. While I'm just coming back to ventral, but when I'm in ventral, even my voice changes. changes. Yeah. And it's interesting because like we always underestimate how our being affects other beings, but this has a lot to do with the state of our nervous system. So if you are in ventral, when you are in a state of regulation, if you're feeling safe and grounded and open and connected, then other people feel that because nervous system read nervous systems. So they start to relax around you a little and you can become someone where they, where they co-regulate with. Yeah. Very if on the other hand you are in a con you know if you are yourself in this you know state then of course people sense that too and they get a little nervous around you too so that's the first state of dysregulation the second state is the state of immobility that's that's when the dorsal vagal complex is being activated this is actually when when we understand okay 
you know, evolutionary, seen from an evolutionary perspective. Okay, you know, if I cannot outrun this lion, I rather collapse and I just go numb. Now, this is not freeze. And I'm coming to that in a second. This is collapse. This is going oh, really slow. Like this is when you are in the state, you're feeling really low. It's very hard to actually hold eye contact. Everything becomes a little slower. It's basically a state of hibernation where you're, you know, everything feels just too hard. Just want to sleep, just, you know, lay in bed and put a blanket over your head and just want to sleep. I don't want to hear anything. I don't want to see anything. I cannot make contact. Um, this goes, can go up to a state where you completely dissociate, meaning you are basically, you have almost an out of body experience. You cannot tell the difference between the chair and yourself. And you're just in a, in a state of, yeah, you know, collapse. So numb, not feeling anything. I'm not feeling anything. I'm just, you know. it's very hard to speak sometimes, even for people when they are in this state. And um, to think, it's just language doesn't come. Thinking doesn't really come. Everything is like it's just very. So the overall experience is I cannot. I cannot. I feel very. Mm. And of course, again. This is an amazing self-protective mechanism. Even now when you're experiencing that, that our body doesn't do that to, to, to harm us. We are actually, he does, it does it, you know, to, when the lion eats you, you're not feeling much. So there is, of course, um, there's always a, a self-protective um, element to that. And then the third state of this regulation is a blended state of the sympathetic and uh, uh, dorsal, which is the, the state of freeze. And freeze has often been explained as the state of immobility, but it's not really true because it's a, it's a combination. So um, when you're in the state of mobile, uh, in the state of freeze, you have all this energy of sympathetic in your system, but you're frozen. You cannot do anything. But inside, it's like, I have to, but I can't. I have to, but I can't. I have to, but I can't, right? And maybe you know that, uh, you know that I'm sure you all know that. Oops. Um, oops, what I'm doing. Okay. Um, you all know that state, I'm sure. You know, you have a lot of energy and you want to do so many things and you have so many ideas. But I do nothing and you just stare at the wall and you're like frozen in the spot and like a you know deer in the headlights yeah you know? so these are the, the different states that we are experiencing when we are activated and now of course the question is so how do how do i regulate <laughs> how do i get out of that yeah and for that, we need to understand that our nervous system doesn't understand cognitive language. Our nervous system um, needs to be shown that we are safe in the here and now. It's not enough to tell ourselves that we are safe in the here and now. And that's why talk therapy, when it comes to, you know, trauma or, 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 or any form of agitated, you know, where our nervous system is very dysregulated, isn't as successful because our prefrontal cortex is not very on, is not very much online. So, so instead, we need to find ways how to speak to our nervous system in a way that it understands. And we can do that through somatic healing tools, very simple exercises. I already showed you a couple of them. So if you remember, on the first day, we did the exercise of orienting. Why did we do that? Because um, one, of the, one of the things that happens when we, when we enter this agitated state is that we, we get this tunnel vision and we be, become so agitated that we kind of, you know, we, we are not, 
we are not taking in the space anymore. So orienting is really telling our system, okay, I'm safe here. I can actually take in details. I can take my time to take take in details. Now, this, this appears to be so super simple, but I've been doing that lately a lot. Like whenever I feel in this agitated state, I'm, I, I really like this exercise of orienting and it always brings me down. Like it always helps me. That's one. Then we did um, something called a gravity hug, where we really just really about coming back into our body by really connecting to gravity and really feeling the heaviness of our body and really feeling, because as I said, in these kind of stays, we pull out of our body. That's one of the first things we do. So really coming back into our body can help us to regulate our nervous system. Again, when we come back into our body, when we are really becoming present in our body, really feeling all of our body, again, we are telling our system we're safe. And yeah, I'm just, I have two thoughts in my mind. So where do I go first? Um, so the third we did today was just uh, moving with the hips, like the slow movement and being present to very slow movements. That's great. And now we'll show you two or three more. Um, the first that I want to do with you is called Wu sound, V-O-O. -O. And that's actually a sound that vib vibrates in a certain way that actually relaxes our vagus nerve and our vagus nerve is actually the one that gets constricted once we are being in activation so the wu sound is really a sound that is a little bit on a like a low voice i will um actually illustrate that in a second and then we can actually do that uh together Let me just see are you still there yeah um so I will show I, I will show that to you how we do that and we'll I actually will do it once and then we can do it together for three times. And all you have to do is really um, just just um, paying attention to the vibration in your chest and in your tummy. okay? That's all you have to do. So you just sit down straight and if you like, and if it feels supportive, you can put a hand on your heart and a, and a hand on your belly. You don't have to. Just only if it feels good to you. And I will just show you what I mean with this Wu sound, okay? So I will do it once and then we can do it together. So I breathe in and out. And then. Okay, so now we do it together, but like a foghorn. One in, out, and breathing in. Do it with me. Nobody hears you. <laughs> notice whenever we do a regulating exercise like that afterwards you just notice what you notice you know how what has changed i feel a little bit more alive my hands are 
full of energy right now. My belly feels a little more relaxed. It can be tiny things like that. I will now show you one more because it's already quite late. Um, and the next one that I want to show you is called soft eyes gaze. And that has the background that um, 